All right. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us this evening. My name is Stephen Moran and I work with State Support Team 11. Uh, I'm a special education and family uh, consultant, amongst other things. Uh, we're extremely thrilled and lucky to have Mr. Jonathan Martinez with us to kick off our four-part series on education, employment, independent living through the lens of the supported decision-making model. We're excited to share this time with educators, families, parents, students, and practitioners statewide and want to thank everyone for being here with us. Jonathan Martinez is a Senior Director for Law and Policy for the Burton Blatt Institute at Syracuse University, leading its efforts to ensure that adults and individuals with disabilities have access to services and supports they need to live independent and inclusive lives. In 2013, Jonathan represented Margaret Jenny Hatch in the Justice for Jenny case the first trial to hold that a person has the right to use supported decision-making model to make their life own life choices instead of being subjected to a permanent unrestricted guardianship. Since then, Jonathan has led supported decision-making projects in New York, Ohio, California, Virginia, Vermont, and the District of Columbia. He has also educated and trained thousands of adults and individuals with disabilities, as well as families and professionals across the country on the dis supported decision-making theory and practice. On behalf of State Support Team 11, I would like to personally thank Mr. Martinez for his time and efforts with getting this series planned and his collaboration with our staff to make sure it is successful and meaningful to all participants involved. We kindly ask that you keep your microphones off during the presentation. There will be time to ask questions, and if you are able to put them in the chat, please do so. If not, you can use the raise hand function and we will do our best to address them. Mr. Martinez encourages questions throughout the discussion to make the experience as interactive as possible. We are expecting a large group for each session, and unfortunately, there, we are limited on time, but we will do our best to fit them all in and address questions that you may have. On another note, we are recording the session, which will be made available to all participants who are registered. With that, I would like to introduce Mr. Jonathan Martinez. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan. I'm very proud to be here today, honored to be here talking with you about my favorite subject, something that I think is the greatest advance in civil rights for people with disabilities since the Americans with Disabilities Act. What we are going to talk about in this presentation and in the ones to follow are supported decision making. What we've decided to do is have everyone come together for this webinar. Um, the idea is for parents and professionals and family members all to talk together about this one. And then our subsequent webinars will be looking at issues from the point of view of parents or professionals. So what this presentation is, is a table setter. It's what I call the why presentation, why we should be looking at supported decision making, why we should be focusing on ways to enhance people's self-determination and their life outcomes, because that's what this is all going to be about. See, if you have heard of supported decision-making, you have no doubt heard about it as an alternative to guardianship, something you can do instead of a guardianship, something you can do to emerge from a guardianship, and that's true. But what I hope to show you going forward in this and in every other one is that supported decision-making is a way to do far more than that. It is a way to enhance life outcomes. It's a way to make people's lives better. If you are a teacher, we can make better educational outcomes. If you are a parent, supported decision making can lead to better quality of life. So that's what we're going to focus on. So before I begin, I always make two promises before I begin any presentation. And they go like this. The first promise is this one. Even though you're going to hear that supported decision making is an alternative to guardianship, you will not hear me say today or ever, that there should never be guardianship. So please don't think if you are a guardian, you're somehow wrong, or if you've ever recommended guardianship, you did the wrong thing. That's not my point in talking to you today. My point in talking to you today and moving forward is to give you options, to give you information that you can consider if that decision ever comes to you. Second promise, everything I tell you today Everything you're gonna see on these slides, every comment I make is going to be backed up by one of two things, either law, including the law in Ohio, or science. So with that in mind, let's begin. The first thing I want you to think about today is something that people don't often think about, which are your rights. 
People without disabilities almost never think about their rights because they just have them. Rights are something we're born with. And the Declaration of Independence says that our rights are uh, inalienable and we are endowed by our creator with them. But think for a second about your rights, about your favorite rights, about the ones that make you proudest to be an American, that make you proudest to be an Ohioan, that you would not want to lose. Things like freedom of speech, like freedom of religion and elections, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now think for a second what they all have in common. They all have choice in common. Think about it. Freedom of speech is the right to choose what to say and what not to say. Freedom of elections is the right to choose who is going to govern us. Freedom of religion is the right to choose how and where and whether we worship. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is how we choose the life we want to live, where we want to live it, and who we want to live it with. So choice is what makes our rights real. It makes our rights possible. There's a quote up on your screen uh, from Jean-Paul Sartre, a philosopher who, if you know anything about him, you know he's not the happiest fellow, but he gets it right in this quote. I am my choices. We are all the sum total of the choices that we make. The good ones, the bad ones, the silly ones, the significant ones. They make us, they shape us. We are who we are because of our choices. So to me, my favorite right is the right to make choices because that's the right that makes everything else possible. Clinically, the right to make choices is, is referred to as self-determination. And you are gonna hear me say that phrase a lot through these webinars. What self-determination is, is just a fancy way of saying being in control of your life. People who are self-determined are the causal actors in their lives, the ones who do things instead of having things done to them, the ones who choose instead of having choices made for them. So when you hear self-determination, think about it this way. That's making choices. People who are self-determined make choices and are directly involved in their lives. And here's something that we know from 40 years of studies. People with disabilities who are more self-determined, who make more choices, have better lives. They are more likely to be healthy, more likely to be employed, more likely to be independent, more likely to achieve in and out of school. They are more likely to be healthier and safer. So I say to the teachers on this webinar, self-determination, as I'm going to show you in subsequent webinars, is the whole point of education. It's why we got into this field, to help the children that we work with grow to be employed and educated and live independently to parents. Self-determination is our ultimate goal as parents to help our children lead the best, most independent, productive, and meaningful lives possible. But here's something else we got to think about. When we think about our rights, think about this. Are they worth anything? Are they even useful if you're not allowed to use them? If I say to you, Steve, you have the freedom of speech, but you're only gonna speak when I tell you to. And you can only say what I say you can say. It's not really a right, is it? Or if I say you have freedom of elections, you can go vote if I take you. And if I take you, you will vote for who I tell you to vote for. That's not really a right, is it? So without choice, rights don't matter because we don't have rights. They're illusory. We don't have the actual choices that go with our rights, but that is exactly what we have done to people with disabilities for about 1500 years. So um, a quick confession, I am a big legal geek. I can tell you that the first time in the Western world that we put the laws together in one place in the Western world, the Eastern world has us beat by thousands of years with the Code of Hammurabi, but in the Western world, the first time we put laws in one place was in ancient Rome, 1500 years ago, there was an emperor named Justinian. Confession, I'm such a legal geek. One of my sons is named Justin. So Emperor Justinian gets all the laws together, puts them in one book called the Justinian Code. The Justinian Code has all the laws, has all the rights, has all the obligations of a citizen. So the first time we had rights was the Justinian Code because we could find them. Well, that Justinian Code said, if you're feeble-minded, and that was their word for people with disabilities, you had to have a curator over you to make your decisions and exercise your rights for you. So the first time we had rights in the Western world 
there was a way to take them away from people with disabilities. And that created what I call an expectation or a culture that people with disabilities need to have their rights taken away or should have people put over them. And that has followed for 1500 years in Great Britain, where we got most of our rights. They updated Justinian in the Middle Ages. What they said is if you are an idiot or a lunatic, and that was their phrase for people with disabilities, you had to have a committee over you to make decisions for you. In America, we followed that pattern. We just call it guardianship. Now remember, there's nothing wrong with guardianship when it's appropriate because guardianship works the same way in just about every state. Every state has its own laws. I'm gonna show you Ohio's in a little bit, but the way guardianship works state to state is it goes like this. If a judge decides that I cannot make some or all decisions, if I'm truly unable to exercise some or all of my rights, what the judge is supposed to do is take away from me the things I truly cannot do and then give them to someone else, say Steve. In that case, Steve is my guardian and Steve has the power to do that which I can't. And if guardianship worked that way, I'd be a huge fan. But what we know from studies is that the vast majority of guardianships, over 90% are what we call full or plenary and they take away all rights, regardless of what the person can do, regardless of the person's abilities, regardless of the person's preferences. Judges just say it all over. I've heard it in so many states. It's just easier to check all the boxes than figure out which ones to check. So those types of guardianships can be dangerous. I mean, here's an example of your law. Ohio law specifically says that we presume the guardian is full or plenary unless the court specifically says that the guardianship is limited it's full, it's plenary. So they start there in Ohio law. We start with the idea that you lose all your rights when you go into a guardianship. And that's not necessarily bad if that's truly what a person needs, but it can be dangerous if it's not. See, guardianships that take away more rights than a person needs to lose or that take away rights when a person doesn't need to lose them are what I call overbroad and undue guardianships because the person doesn't need them and yet still under your law loses all rights. And when that happens, you get someone, a guardian who has incredible power going into the most basic areas of a person's life. I mean, again, look at your law. The guardian can authorize or approve medical care, health treatment, counseling, services, and anything else on the behalf of the, of the ward. So we have to realize that guardianship is neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It is a thing and it exists and it can be very good when it's needed. But when it's not, people can lose control over the most basic areas of their life. And that's dangerous. Because just like we know that self-determination is a good thing, that it leads to a better quality of life, we have known for more than 40 years, almost 50 years now, that when people with disabilities lose their self-determination, when they lose their right to make choices, their lives can get worse. We knew as long ago as 1975 that people with disabilities who lost their self-determination would feel helpless, hopeless, and self-critical. The rest of that sentence on your screen is they would not behave because they saw no point in behaving. We also know that people who lose their self-determination become more passive. They have lower self-esteem. They are less able to function. Often they will not try to do new things because they're afraid that they will quote unquote fail at them. And that's not rocket science, is it? If I tell you over and over and over again that you cannot do something, are you feeling particularly motivated to try or to try anything else? So what I tell people is that guardianship is, when it's overbroad and undue, can cause more problems than you think it's solving because it can make people's lives worse. The very people whose lives you want to make better. And that is something that we have known about for more than 30 years. The quote up on your screen right now is almost 35 years old. It's a quote from a congressman named Claude Pepper. Uh, congressman Pepper chaired the House Committee on Aging in 1987, when they did the first review of guardianship in the American Congress. And what they did was they looked at guardianship laws, they talked to guardians, talked to people under guardianship. And what you're looking at on your screen is pretty much page one, paragraph one 
of their findings. Let's look together. Look at the bold words. The typical ward has fewer rights than the typical convicted felon. When we have people in these overbroad and undue guardianships, we have someone with the power to decide where they go, who they see, what they do, what, if any, medical care they get. And like the congressman said, and sometimes when they die, it is in one short sentence, the most punitive civil penalty that can be levied against an American citizen. And the rest of that sentence is except for the death penalty. So where can we go from here? Major promise, I'm gonna keep it. I promised you, and I agree with this, there are absolutely times when guardianship is appropriate. I am not here to say there should never be guardianships. Of course, if a person is so disabled, they cannot take part in the decision-making process, a guardianship is appropriate. If a person does not want to take part in the decision-making process and is putting him or herself at risk, of course, guardianship's appropriate. In emergency situations, when there is no one around to support the person, a temporary guardianship may be exactly what's needed. So I'm not here to say there should never be guardians. What I am here to say is there should never be guardianships just because you have a certain disability. Just because you're 17, you're about to turn 18 and you have a disability, or just because you're a certain number of years old, or just because you need help doing things, or the two at the bottom that frankly turn my stomach because I hear them again and again and again. One, because that's the way it's always been, and two, because it's for your own good. And I hear that one a lot for your own good. My son or my daughter or my student or my friend has to have a guardian for his or her own good. Well, in the face of all of these studies showing that losing self-determination is most assuredly not for people's own good, I always stop and pause a bit when I hear that. Because again, I, th I realize that the vast majority of people seeking guardianship, and I know guardianship has been in the news with Britney Spears. I know there have been movies that talk about bad guardians. I also know from going across this country that the vast majority of people seeking guardianship, probably 99%, have the best of intentions. Their family members, their friends, their concerned citizens who mean well, who are looking to protect people, who are looking to help people. But here's the thing. There's a great quote up on your screen, and the quote up on your screen is over 90 years old, and it's still as correct today as it was then. What the Supreme Court said was when we mean the most well, that's when we have to be the most careful. The greatest dangers to liberty lurk in the insidious encroachment by people of zeal who are well-meaning but act without understanding. In other words, when we mean well but don't consider the consequences or not familiar with the potential consequences, bad things can happen. When we mean well but take away self-determination when it doesn't need to be taken away, a person's quality of life, scientifically speaking, gets worse. But I hear it time and time again. My son or my daughter needs a guardianship because they might sign something they shouldn't sign or meet someone they shouldn't meet or do something they shouldn't do or go someplace they shouldn't go. We need to get a guardianship for protection. We need to get a guardianship to protect them from making those kinds of mistakes. And again, you're never going to hear me question a parent. I am a parent. I know that the number one obligation of a parent is to protect your child. But I also know this that that standard for your own good is really scary. And I'll tell you why. Because when I hear it, when someone tells me my son or my daughter might sign something they shouldn't sign, the first thing I think is, um, have you ever closed on a mortgage? Have you ever had that mortgage ceremony that I've had a bunch of times because I'm like the mortgage crisis from the mid 2000s made flesh. But if you've ever signed a mortgage, you ever had one of those ceremonies, what you probably experienced is what I did. You sat around a table in an office and there was a bunch of people at that table around you. There was a, a lawyer, there was a seller's agent, there was an agent. If you're lucky, you had an agent. But one thing that was definitely at that mortgage closing was a stack of papers going up to the ceiling. And those papers were handed to you one at a time. And every time they were handed to you, they were, you were told this, sign them. If you're like me, you didn't read them first. And if you're like me, what you did and you can be honest because you were probably like me. You put hundreds of thousands of dollars of your money and probably 30 years of your life in the hands of a bank. 
and you didn't read the papers, you didn't catch the fine print, you didn't know if that bank's even under indictment. That's a horrible decision. You signed something you shouldn't sign. You put your money at risk. And then I ask, have you ever had surgery? I have. Uh, and I can tell you, I remember every second of it because I'm a giant baby when it comes to medical care. Uh, my knee was going to get done. They're wheeling me into the surgery center. My heart is going a thousand miles an hour. I am praying for Valium. And then people I have never met are getting up in front of my face speaking jargon. I'm your doctor. I'm your nurse. I'm your anesthesiologist. And talking what they're going to do to me and shoving papers in my face and saying, sign them. Well, if you're like me, you signed them without reading them. And you're probably like me. And what that means is you put your lives in the hands of strangers. You probably waived your right to sue. That's a horrible decision. You put your life at risk. Now, we're hopefully coming out of this pandemic. It's been a good, what, year and a half. And uh, we've all had different coping skills. I'll tell you one of mine. Maybe it's one of yours, too. Uh, mine is have a few too many drinks and go on Amazon.com. And you see what comes the next day. Prime has my bad decision showing up on my doorstep the next day. I can know what kind of day I had by what shows up on my doorstep. I know I'm stress eating if yet another piece of fitness equipment shows up. I know I had the munchies if it's a pasta maker. So if you've done that, if you've impulse shopped, if you've done things like that, then you have made all these mistakes. Think about what you've done. You've signed things you shouldn't have signed. You've bought things you shouldn't have bought. You've done things you shouldn't have done. You have put your life and your money and your health care at risk. These are horrible decisions. And then I ask questions like this. Have you ever had a bad relationship and had it teach you what a good one is? Have you ever made a mistake in your life and said, that's a learning experience, or well, that's a teachable moment, or one of those cliches that we use about making mistakes. Have you ever been a rescue buddy or been rescued by a buddy? Ever wake up the morning after and go, wow, I am not doing that again. Kind of glad I did. Now I have a story. Now I have an experience, and now I've learned what not to do. If you've done those things, then doesn't that mean you need a guardian? Because you have signed things you shouldn't have signed and met people you shouldn't have met and done things you shouldn't have done and made horrible mistakes with your life, your health, your safety, and your money. We've all done it. Doesn't it mean we all need guardians? Except we don't. Because those things, those mistakes, they made us who we are. They taught us who we want to be by showing us what we don't want to be. The mistakes we make, that quote from John Paul Sartre in the beginning, he was wrong. You're not your choices. You are the result of your bad choices. Your mistakes are what shaped you. And when we say, as I have heard so many people say, that guardianship is needed for the person's own good, aren't we saying they're not allowed to grow? They're not allowed to become the better, stronger, smarter adults that we are because of our mistakes, with the best of intentions. Aren't we dooming them to forever being inexperienced in life? I'll give you another example. Um, if you can think of back to uh, 1995, if you can remember 1995, I'm sure there's some people here who remember 1995. Others were probably in grade school or not even born yet. The more I do these presentations, the more I realize that many of the people I talked to weren't alive in 1995. And uh, on behalf of the rest of us, we can't stand you for being that young. Everyone else, though, if you can remember 1995, um, what, what things were like for people with disabilities in 1995. 1995 was only five years after the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. It was still four years before the Supreme Court decided that people with disabilities had the right to live in a community. Now, what I mean is, in 1995, it was perfectly legal to say to a person with disabilities, you will live in an institution. You have no choice. You will live there. Don't care what you can do. Don't care what you want to do. You will live in an institution. In 1995, a sheltered workshop where people with disabilities work in a segregated setting making less than minimum wage was considered a, uh, a desired outcome. Schools and vocational rehabilitation agencies would brag about the number of people they placed in sheltered workshops. In 1995, we didn't have things like Medicaid waivers or supports and services. We certainly didn't have the technology like we have today. What I want you to do now is fast forward to today, 26 years, one generation, if you think about it. As we sit here today in 2021, community integration, the right to live in the community instead of being warehoused in an institution, 
is a Supreme Court protected right. The right to work in the community, paying, making regular wages, working regular hours, if that's what you want to do with people with and without disabilities, is an expectation. Someday, God willing, I will say it's a right. Now, in 2021, we have services and supports. We have technology. Consider the phones that we all carry around. The phones that I, I certainly hope you're not spending time looking at now because I'm boring you. But these phones, you realize we spend more time <laughs> We spend far more time on our phones doing things other than talking. Our phones are so much more than phones. Our phones can connect us. With our phones, we can have a telemedicine appointment with a doctor. And we can loop in another person to make sure I understand the doctor, the doctor understands me. With my phone, I can check my bank balance. And I can, if I want, loop in a third person to make sure I'm, I'm not overspending my budget. With my phone, I can set reminders so that I can don't miss appointments or take medication. Here's an example. I have a client I work with has uh, diabetes and a traumatic brain injury. Um, sometimes because of her TBI, she forgets to watch her, her glucose. And a couple of times she's had health crises. She is exactly the type of person who would be in an institution in 1995. But you know what she has? She has a free app, a free app. It connects her monitor to her phone. So if her blood sugar gets too low, it sends her a text, you should eat something. If it continues to get low, it texts her mother, her sister, and her doctor so they can intervene. And just like that, with a free app, someone who would, who would just 25 years ago have been in an institution now lives independently and keeps a normal job. So that is the difference between 1995 and now. There's no one out here who can tell me we are not in a better, smarter, stronger age now than in 1995, or that we have more ways to make more people more independent than ever before. Well, then answer me this question. Why have the number of people under guardianships tripled since 1995? The estimated number of people under guardianship has gone from 500,000 in 1995 to almost 1.5 million today. That's a million more people have gone into guardianship in just 26 years. And before you tell me it's because we're aging, we are. The fastest growing segment of people going into guardianship are young adults with disabilities aged 18 to 24. If you are 18 with an intellectual disability, according to the National Council on Disability, you are more likely to be in guardianship than an 85-year-old. That's what happens when we mean well. And that's why I say 1,500 years of assuming there are no other options are too many, because the science is scary. We know from research and studies that people who are in overbroad and undue guardianships can suffer a significant negative impact on their physical and mental health. They can live less long, feel less well, do less well. On the other hand, we know that people who have more self-determination, who make more choices, remember, have a better quality of life. They're more likely to be independent, more likely to be parts of their communities, more likely to be employed. And here's the big one. The number one reason I hear why people want guardianship is safety. It's a mom or a dad saying, if I don't get guardianship, my son or my daughter might get abused. And again, I never question parents' urge to protect, but I do talk about science. And here's a study that, that really brings that home. There's a professor named Yoshida Kempka in New York, and Dr. Kempka has de dedicated a huge part of her career to looking at the interplay between self-determination and safety. And this particular study, in this one, she worked with women with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We don't know this, you should. Women with intellectual and developmental disabilities are exponentially more likely to be abused or neglected than any other segment of the population. Women with intellectual and developmental disabilities are more likely to be physically, emotionally, sexually abused than anyone else. It's, it's awful. So what Dr. Kempka did was she worked with a group of women with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I'm not a researcher, so I call this an apples to apples study because the group all had similar abilities and limitations. And what she did was she divided them up, classic experiment. She had one group that she called the control group. And then she told, go live your life. Another group she called the experimental group. And to the experimental group, she gave access to a curriculum that is designed to teach people to be more self-determined, to have them be more apt to make decisions, to know about their rights, to take more control over their lives. 
When they finished up the curriculum, she brought the two groups back together and she gave all of them a test, a recognized test that is designed to measure how well people can recognize potentially abusive situations. Here's what she found. Apples to apples, remember. The ones with more self-determination were better able to recognize abusive situations and therefore better able to avoid them. They were safer. So I have told people and professionals and parents and judges across the country, if you want to keep people safe, don't take away rights. Build abilities, build self-determination. It's not rocket science. Aren't you more protective of what you know is yours? If you know it's your body, your life, your choice, your things, aren't you less likely to give them away? Aren't you more likely to protect them if someone tries to take them? So I tell people safety is directly related to self-determination. And here's what I always call the cherry on top of the Sunday. The one that what you see on your screen is called the National Core Indicator Study. The National Core Indicator Study was done in 46 of the 50 states. It was done in Ohio. What it was, was a study that looked at the quality of life of people with disabilities. And it looked at the way certain things, certain variables impacted the quality of life of people with disabilities. And again, this was an apples to apples study. It even divided up people with disabilities into the old names, mild, moderate, and severe. So they compared people with mild disabilities, people with mild disabilities, moderate, moderate, severe, severe. And what they looked at again, was the impact of certain variables on quality of life. One of the things, just one, that they looked at was whether or not a person had a guardian. And what they found in Ohio and in every other state was this. Apples to apples, remember. People with disabilities who did not have guardians were more likely to work, live independently, have friends, date and socialize in the community, and practice the religion of their choice. They did that study again a couple of years later, just to double check it, and they found the same thing. Apples to apples, people with disabilities without guardians were more likely to live in their own home, more likely to make their own choices, more likely to be parts of the community, more likely to be respected, more likely to work, date, and get married. And I tell this to everyone listening, if the only thing standing in between having what you see on your screen and not having what you see on your screen may just well be having a guardian, doesn't it mean we should think about it? Not that there should never be guardianships, but that before we jump into it, before we assume it's the only option, we think about it. That 1,500 years of assuming it's our only choice is too much. So where can we go from here? Again, I hope I have shown you that self-determination is the key to a good life for people with disabilities. And I hope I have shown you that losing self-determination can hurt the quality of life for people with disabilities. But if you agree with those two things, there's one more thing we have to agree on. Self-determination is not just saying, off you go, live your life. Vaya con Dios. That's not self-determination because that ignores the fact that people need help. People with disabilities need help. Everyone needs help. Every day we get help to do the things we have to do. So what I say is we have to agree to this, and I hope we can. I hope we can agree that what we should be doing is maximizing the self-determination of people with disabilities, helping them to be as self-determined as they possibly can, because that is the key to a good life for people with disabilities, while at the same time making sure that they have the help they need to exercise that self-determination effectively and safely. And if you agree with that, I have a story to tell you. So this young woman you see on your screen, uh, her name's Jenny, uh, Jenny Hatch. Uh, I met Jenny in 2013, uh, time flies. But when I met her, Jenny was 29 years old. Uh, Jenny had graduated high school. Jenny had had a job for five years, not a special job, not a supported job, a regular job making regular wages, paying regular taxes. Jenny had her own apartment, not a group home, her own apartment with a roommate. By all accounts, it was kept spotlessly. Jenny had friends in the community. She had a church she went to every Sunday. She was politically active. People knew her, she knew people. And that is what Jenny had. Jenny had a life. And that is what Jenny wanted, a life. And for 29 years, she had it. 
She went to work, she came home, she lived her life, she saw her friends, all well and good. Till the day she was hit by a car while she was riding her bike. And after she was hit by that car and hurt her back, by the way, the car accident had no impact on her cognitive abilities. She found herself facing a guardianship. Her mother and her stepfather sought to become her guardians. So in August of 2012, before I ever met Jenny, in August of 2012, she walked into a courtroom in Newport News, Virginia, tiny little courtroom, by the way. She walked in there with all her rights, with all the rights you have, with all the rights everyone has, with all the rights every American has. And it took three hours, only three hours. She walked out with none of them. Because when I met Jenny in 2013, this is her situation. She was in what the court was calling a temporary guardianship with no end in sight. She had gone from her own apartment to a segregated group home because her guardians put her in a segregated group home. It was a nice place behind barbed wire. Jenny had gone from her own job where she had been making regular wages and paying regular taxes and working regular hours to being told she had to work in the sheltered workshop that was attached to the group home where she, in her own description, snapped snaps together all day and was bored. I saw her financial records. She worked more or less full time for eight months. She made less than $1,000 total. Jenny's cell phone was taken away. Her Facebook password was changed. Her laptop was taken away. Her guardians controlled all access to her. And by that, I mean this. If you wanted to see or speak with Jenny, you had to fill out a permission slip. You had to literally fill out a permission slip and give it to the guardian saying who you were, what you wanted to do, what you want to talk about, and how long you would do it. And this is when people don't believe me. So I always tell them I, I, I can prove it. I put it online. If you go to JennyHatchJusticeProject.org, there is a section right there on Jenny and a drop down that says the Justice for Jenny trial. You'll see it. You'll see the request for visitation form that people had to fill out just to be able to talk to Jenny. And if you filled that form out, you had to uh, obey by the rules of visitation. That was on the back of the form. The back of the form had the rules of visitation on it. Rule number one, you're not allowed to talk to her about her guardianship. Do you know why? Because they said it upset her. Do you know why it upset her? She didn't want to be in guardianship. She wanted to go back to her work and she was told, get used to your new life, you work here. She wanted to go to her church and was told, get used to your new life, we go to this church. She wanted to see her friends. She was told to make new friends. So you weren't allowed to talk to Jenny about her guardianship because it upset her. Well, the first time I met Jenny, her lawyer at the time asked me to come visit her and I didn't know about the permission slip and I wasn't gonna fill one out anyway. Spoiler alert, if you talk fast, carry a briefcase, you can get it anywhere. So I met Jenny and I said, I'd, I'd like to become your lawyer. Can I help you? And she said, yes, be my lawyer. So I did. I became Jenny's attorney. And one of the first things I did was I contacted the attorney for the guardians. And I said, this case had gotten some attention. It had been on the news. And I said, look, this case is, is kind of high profile. I know you think she needs a guardian. We don't. Why don't we just move this to court and let the judge decide? But I have a question. This permission slip thing doesn't apply to me, does it? And I was told, yes, it does. And I said, are you telling me that as her lawyer, I can't talk to her about her case? And I was told, yes, those are the rules. I want you to stop and think for a second, okay? I'll stop the story and, and, and give you an example of what I mean of why overbroad and undue guardianship can be so dangerous. I want you to think about if Jenny Hatch was an ax murderer, and she was found holding an ax and holding a head and covered in person and saying that she did it. You know what she would have the right to do in that situation? Talk to a lawyer. But Jenny Hatch wasn't lucky enough to be an ax murderer because apparently people with disabilities under guardianship don't have the same rights as ax murderers. So the first time I went to court for Jenny, it was just to ask the judge to let me talk to her. And again, people look at me like I must be making this up. So I put it online. Jenny Hatch Justice Project, Justice for Jenny trial. You'll see the motion I had to file just asking to talk to Jenny about her case. You'll see the emails we got from the other attorney saying that you're not allowed to. So thank God, by the way, because we have to go to court and argue and file a brief. 
just so she could have the same rights as an axe murderer. And thank God the judge said she does. So I got to talk to Jenny because I was thinking the same thing I think you probably are. Why the hell does she have a guardian? If she was working and she had her own place in her own life, why would she need a guardian? So I read her file. And the first thing I saw in the file was the order putting her in guardianship. I'm not gonna bore you with the whole thing, but I do want you to look at this paragraph from the order. It said, the guardians had the power to decide who sees her, what kind of support she gets, what kind of healthcare she gets, what kind of services she gets, what kind of education she gets, what kind of treatment she gets and where she lives. If you look at that order, ask yourself if she had any rights left. And when someone else has this kind of power over you, are you even an American anymore? Those rights that are so important to you that I asked you to think about, they're all gone. Imagine how you would feel in that situation. So I kept reading. The next thing I saw was the transcript from that hearing I told you about. Remember, she had a three hour hearing, lost all her rights in three hours. What I learned was that the star witness of that hearing was a psychologist. See, after Jenny's operation, pardon me, Jenny's operation after her accident, they sent a psychologist in to interview her, to do what's called a capacity evaluation, to determine if she can make decisions for herself. And that psychologist who'd never met her before, by the way, and knew nothing about her, evaluated Jenny while Jenny was on Percocet. So that was the psychologist testifying. And you can see right up on your screen, the bold words are the psychologist's exact words. When she was asked about whether Jenny could live independently, she said, if Jenny had assistance, she might be able to do that. When asked about legal skills, she would need assistance to understand a legal document. What about managing her money? She would need assistance with a bank account. When asked what Jenny really needs, she said Jenny's going to need assistance to make decisions about her health care and her life. When asked what would be best for Jenny, she said what would be beneficial to Jenny would be surrounded by people who know her, who care about her, who love her, who give her the assistance she needs. Next thing I saw in the file was a power of attorney. See, when Jenny turned 18, and she was, remember, uh, 29 at the time, when Jenny turned 18, her parents had her sign a power of attorney. And that power of attorney was in the file. It was one of those ones you pull offline that's like that big and has the legal words that even I as a lawyer wouldn't understand. So we asked, and we said, if what you're saying is that Jenny can't understand things and can't make decisions, how did she make the decision to sign this power of attorney? And I expected, frankly, that they would say, well, we thought she could, we wanted to give her the chance, but now we know better, but nope, they doubled down. Their answer is right up on your screen. They said Jenny could understand it. You know why? She had an attorney who explained it to her. An attorney went over the document with her, got to know Jenny, got to understand her, went through it page by page and line by line. And on the bottom of your screen, based on this series of observations over several visits, the attorney concluded and we concurred that Jenny was capable of understanding these documents. At trial, they tripled down and even said their doctor agreed that Jenny was capable of understanding it because it was explained to her. Okay, so what this means, and I talked to Jenny at least once every couple of weeks. So I know Jenny very well and have for the last eight years. So what I can tell you is that that psychologist was right. Broken clocks are right twice a day. Even though she examined Jenny on Percocet, that psychologist was right. Because I will tell you 100% that she needs assistance to understand legal issues. Part of what I help her with. She definitely needs under assistance, assistance with her, her medical care. She definitely needs assistance managing her money and with managing her day-to-day -day life. Needs assistance in these areas. You know what that makes her human? There is no person listening to me right now, no person in the world right now, who does all of the things in all of their lives without assistance. We all get assistance every single day. And that is not a sin. In fact, we are complimented when we get assistance. We are told to make informed choices. On the job, we are often evaluated by how well we work with others, unless you're a person with disabilities. Because apparently, if you're a person with disabilities, needing assistance means you can't do things. So what we had to show the court was that there is no sin in getting assistance. In fact, getting assistance is good. So we told the court about supported decision making. And yes, I know I am now 32 slides into this presentation and finally getting to the point. But what we told the court was supported decision making is a way 
for Jenny to get assistance and not need a guardian. So what is supported decision-making? Well, there's a definition on your screen and you can screenshot this. You can have access to this, this thing and you can quote this, you can memorize it. Lord knows this definition comes up in textbooks and articles. Supported decision-making is a recognized alternative to guardianship through which people with disabilities use friends, family members and professionals to help them understand the situations and choices they face so they may make their own decisions without the need for a guardian. That's a definition. That's my name at the bottom. I wrote this. So if you want a definition of supported decision-making, there it is. But if you ask me, I'd like you to forget this. So I think this is crap. I think this is pseudo-intellectual, overly complicated crap. If you want to know what supported decision-making is, ask yourself how you make decisions. What do you do when the doctor speaks jargon? If you're like me, you say, can you please explain that in plain language? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you need advice? What do you do when you're so close to an issue you don't know what to do? What do you do when it's something you've never dealt with before on the job? You get help. You talk to someone. You find the person in your life who knows about it. So that is what supported decision making is. It's getting help when you need it to do the things you have to do to understand the things you have to understand and make the decisions you have to make. That's it. And we use supported decision-making every day. We just don't call it that. In fact, think about all of the cliches in the English language for supported decision-making. We use them every day. Don't go off half cock. Don't make a snap judgment. Get a second opinion. Make an informed choice. My dad used to say, if you measure twice, you only have to cut once. They all mean the same thing. Get help. It is a good thing to request assistance. It is a virtue to need help. We should use supported decision-making unless you're a person with disabilities. Because if you're like Jenny Hatch and you say, I don't understand, can you explain that to me? What society tends to assume and has assumed it for 1500 years is that needing help to do something means you can't do anything. And as we have shown, studies show time and time again, people lose their rights to do everything. So we had to show this judge that Jenny could make decisions and did make decisions. And we put on six days worth of evidence, super overkill, about decisions she had made with support. Her case manager testified and her case manager was, in my opinion, very in favor of guardianship. But we asked her, how could Jenny sign her Medicaid waiver plan if she can't understand it? And the case manager said, oh no, we use person-centered planning in Virginia. We went through that document page by page and line by line. We read it to her. We made sure she understand it. We would not go to the next page unless we were sure she understood the last page. And when we were sure she understood the page, she initialed it. And when we were sure she understood every page, she signed it herself. And signing it herself was a huge thing because when Jenny was in the hospital, she had to get surgery. We asked her, we asked, how could Jenny have signed a consent for surgery? And let me tell you, we heard stories from both her father and her stepfather, how needle phobic Jenny is. And she was not going to sign off on the surgery, but she, they told the story of how great the doctor was. The doctor got down in front of Jenny on one knee and said, I have to do this. This is going to help you walk better. There will be one needle. When you wake up, it'll be gone. And her father and her stepfather and her mother and her family said, Jenny, we need you to do this. This is important and explained it to her. And you know what? She got it and she signed the document herself. And we kept hearing that time and time again, that when Jenny got support, she was able to make the decision and sign it herself. So after all that time, we finally get down to what I'm sure you'll be shocked to hear is my favorite part of every trial, closing argument. That is when I get to do every Al Pacino imitation I've ever practiced. So closing argument was me for an hour going around the courtroom saying she can do this. She has done this and she does not need a guardian because she uses supported decision making. When I was done, the judge said, I'll be back in 15 minutes. He was gone for an hour and which was good because it gave me time to prepare Jenny to lose. So I was quite sure we were going to lose. Um, the plan was always to win in the Court of Appeals. This judge, before I got involved in the case, had been quoted as saying, I have a nephew with this affliction. I'd want him protected. This judge was giving off signs that he did not want her to have her independence. So an hour later, 
the judge came out and started reading his order and the order is available on the Jenny Hatch Justice Project site. And if you look at it, you'll see the first four pages are all about why she needs a guardian. So that let me get into what I call turbo lawyer mode and, and put my hand on Jenny's shoulder and tell her, we're gonna fight this and everything's gonna be okay. You can fight this, you can be brave. It's been a year, we can go longer. And Jenny said what she always said every time he we went to court. She said, he's gonna send me home. And hand to God, the second she said that, the judge said the word, however. And my head went up because no, no lawyer wants to be on the wrong side of the word, however. What the judge said was, however, I do think you need a guardian for some things. You have not proven to me that you don't need a guardian for anything. So what the judge said is you will be in guardianship, Jenny, over two things, health decisions and safety decisions. Everything else, you have the right to make decisions from now on. And we thought, okay, it's a start. Then the judge said, the guardians will not be your parents. You see, I didn't tell you about Jim and Kelly. Jim Talbert and Kelly Morris were Jenny's employers, the people she worked for. And when Jenny was in the hospital and had surgery, when she came out, she couldn't go back to her apartment. She needed a specialized bed and rehabilitation and her parents would not take her in. I have no problem saying that, it's in the court record. Do you know who took her in when she had nowhere to go? Her bosses, who does that? So Jim and Kelly took Jenny in and they lived together and that's where Jenny wanted to live. And what Jim and Kelly did when they heard that Jenny was gonna be in a guardianship, they went to fight for her. They hired their own attorney. They dropped like 50 grand on their own attorney. I was Jenny's attorney, they had their own attorney and their attorney argued one thing, she doesn't need a guardian, but if she has to have one, let it be us. She wants to live with us and we will support her. So the judge said, you are under guardianship and your guardians will be Mr. Talbert and Miss Morris. Better, then the judge says that guardianship ends in one year and it did. Jenny has been out of guardianship since August of 2014, seven years now, and she's doing just fine. She's living where she wants to live and working how she wants to work. And then the judge said that the guardian's job, this is the first time any judge has ever said this, the guardian's job is not to make decisions for the person. The guardians will not make decisions for Jenny. Your job is to make decisions with Jenny. Your job is to help her learn to make her own decisions using supported decision-making. Because that day she walked out like that. Because the judge said to Jim and Kelly, get her home. Get her out of that group home, get her back to work. And that's how she walked out of the courtroom. That's the front page of the Washington Post. Um, and that's my favorite picture that doesn't have one of my children in it because look at her face. She had been told to give up and she didn't. So Jenny got justice that day. Well, I gotta tell you, it's a great story, but if it's only a story, I just wasted about 15 minutes of your time. Because Jenny's story can't just be a story. It's gotta lead to a question. It's gotta lead to the question of why Jenny got justice, why she got this freedom that so many others don't get. And it's so tempting to say it's because she's awesome. I mean, she is pretty awesome, but that's not the reason. Jenny got what she got because she had help. Jim and Kelly, professionals, people came from across the country to testify for her. The media loved her, can you imagine? She had a judge who was listening, willing to listen and learn. A judge who went from talking about afflictions to being the first trial judge to use the word supported decision-making. So that means she got lucky. That's the moral of Jenny's story. That's why I didn't waste your time because that's what we have to realize. Jenny Hatch got lucky. Take away Jim and Kelly, take away that judge, take away the media, take away experts. And she is right back in that group home, probably right now. So that's the moral of Jenny's story. That's what we have to take out of it. Self-determination, justice, rights should not depend on luck. They should be where we start, not end where we end up. They should be our sole focus, making sure that people have opportunities. And that's so important because that's what your law says. Ohio law right now says that a person can only be put in a guardianship when they're incompetent. And you are only incompetent, look at the bold word, if you are incapable of taking care of yourself or your property. Incapable. So what does incapable mean? You already know the answer to that question, don't you? Because you know that capable isn't something you have or you don't. Because there are some things that you are capable of doing right now without help. 
There are other things that you totally need help for. You are capable of doing them, but you need help to do them. There are some things that there is no way you can do unless you get help. Want an example? Unless you have a medical license, you are not capable of taking care of your health because you can't diagnose yourself. You can't prescribe medication. When I get sick, I go to the doctor. I tell the doctor my symptoms. The doctor prescribes me a pill. I take the pill. I'm capable of taking that pill, but I have no idea what's in that pill. I have no idea what the doctor decided. I have no idea the tests they're running. I don't know how to take care of my health, but I trust my doctor. I'm capable of taking care of my health because my doctor is available to help me. So what we have to realize is being capable depends on the help we have. There are some days when we're not capable. There are some days you know you've done it where you've said, I'm overwhelmed, I'm overloaded. I can't be doing important things today. There's other days where you have said, I need you by my side, person in my life. You were capable because you had someone by your side. So what I'm saying, what that all adds up to is the need to ask two questions before guardianship. First question goes like this. If you can only take care of yourself or your property, if you have help, are you incapable? And the answer to that has to be no. Because if needing help means you're incapable, we'd all need guardians, which means we have a second question. And it goes like this. Before seeking, before recommending, before trying to get a guardian, you ask this question. What else have you tried? Have you tried supportive decision making? Or are you just assuming that a person can't do things? So I got to tell you, 98% of the time, of course, a person in a coma, a person at the end stage of Alzheimer's, and some people who are so severely disabled probably can't make decisions. Certainly a person in a coma needs a guardian. But so many other people can be empowered that we have to ask this question. What else have you tried? And I urge judges all the time to ask that question. Because I say to judges, you can't know how capable a person is until you know what's been tried to empower that person. That is not my position only. That is the position of the National Guardianship Association. The National Guardianship Association is made up of guardians, by guardians, for guardians. They license guardians. They certify guardians. They train guardians. They have a code of ethics for guardians. Their website is guardianship.org. And what they say is this, before guardianship, Try supported decision-making. It might work. It might not. If it doesn't work, guardianship's probably okay. But based upon what we know about the value of self-determination and the importance of rights, what's the rush? Shouldn't we try to empower first? Because supported decision-making can do for people with disabilities what it does for all of us. We all use supported decision-making every day to focus our attention on the important details, to talk with people, to make sure we have our options considered, the pros and our cons, to make sure that we're not making a snap judgment or going off half-cocked, and to make sure that the decisions we make are thought out properly. That's what supported decision-making does for you. And that's what it can do for people with disabilities if we try it. And here's something else you already know. If you're thinking to yourself, get to the point, hippie, how do we do it? What's step one? What's step two? What's step three? Where's the book? Where's an app? I'm going to tell you there isn't one. I'm telling you as a person who's written two books on the subject, there is no one way to use supported decision making. And you already know that because the way you use it is different from the way I use it. Some people just need someone to talk to, informal support, a listening ear or a shoulder. Some people have what I call go-to people. I always go to my sister, who is an educational professional, with questions about my kid's school. I always go to my brother, who is a financial professional, with questions about money. I have a friend I go to with questions about cars. These are people who know things more than me. They're my go-to people. We can put things like that in documents like powers of attorney and advanced directives and IEPs and ISPs. And I'm gonna show you that in the next part of the series. There's also some people who use micro boards and circles of support, which were some of the first studies were done in Ohio on this, where people have people in their lives and they meet with them regularly, like a personal board of directors. And they talk about their life and they get advice from them. So the person can then take that advice and understand and make decisions about their life. Well, all of those are supported decision-making, all of them, because all of them involve me getting information and support from you so I can make the decisions I need to make in my life. 
So what I say about supporting decision-making, there's only three rules. If you follow these rules, you follow these guidelines, or I call them commandments of supporting decision-making, you are an advocate and you're a user and they're easy. Number one, we all agree right here, right now that everyone has the right to make decisions to the maximum of their ability. And that's easy because that is the declaration of independence. We hold those truths to be self-evident. Number two, I can ask you for help to exercise my rights without you saying that must mean you can't do it. And that's easy because we do that every day when we ask for advice. And last, we realize there are as many ways to give and get help as there are people. You ever go to plan B? Of course you have. Plan D, plan Q, plan Z. Sometimes we have to try different ways. The first thing you try to empower someone may not work. Every teacher knows. Sometimes the IEP has to be adjusted. So we may have to try different things to empower the person, but we can keep trying because something might work or nothing might work. And if nothing works, guardianship's fine, but we should not rush into it. And the reason it's so important to try this is going back to where we began, how self-determination is the key to a better life for people with disabilities. What we're finding from research is that people who use supported decision-making have more self-determination, not rocket science. If I am using supported decision-making to make my own decisions, instead of having someone make decisions for me, I'm going to have more control over my life. And we have 40 years of studies that say when I do, my life's better. In fact, this year in Virginia, we had a study that showed just that. Uh, in Virginia, we worked with uh, young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities across the spectrum of abilities. And what we did was we empowered them to use supported decision-making. We told them and their families and their friends about supported decision-making. And we said, make a plan, come up with something. We didn't give them a form, didn't make them do certain things, just said, work with the people in your life for a plan. And they did amazing things. Some of them had spreadsheets. Some of them just said what they wanted to do. One person made a chart and they had a plan. And then we said, go make your plan work. And every now and then we talked to them. We talked to their supporters. We did interviews. We collected data. And after a year, here's what we found. All of them, every one of them who used supported decision-making was more independent, more confident, and was better at making decisions. They were also made better decisions according to their families and supporters. And even in the middle of a pandemic, most of them talked about doing more things in the community and having a better quality of life. So Ohio law recognizes everything we just talked about. Ohio law already says these things. So talking to parents, talking to professionals, if you're thinking about, well, what is this supported decision-making and how does it fit into our law and guardianship? Look at your law. Your law says that the court should consider less restrictive alternatives to guardianship. They should be introduced and the court should consider it. And the court, if it finds there is a less restrictive alternative, should not put a person in guardianship. Well, that's supported decision-making. You should be thinking, the court should be thinking. I have told Ohio judges, you should be looking for these things because that is the what else have you tried question. But even if a person is in guardianship, the guardian's whole job is to make decisions in that person's best interests. In other words, what are you trying when you're the guardian? We already know what's in person's best interests. We have 40 years of studies that show that supported decision-making and self-determination are in people's best interests. So what we know from Ohio's law is that if a person under guardianship learns, learns to make decisions, gains or regains the ability to make decisions, if a person gets that ability they didn't have before, then the court should end that guardianship. So really what that means is if you are a guardian, your job is to do everything you can to build that person's abilities, to help that person learn to use supported decision-making, to learn to make decisions to the best of their abilities. And if they're able to do it, not everyone can, but if they are, the best job of a guardian is to go back to the judge and say, good news, judge, I did my job. You can fire me. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen because it happens in amazing ways. These are all people who were in guardianships, who had lost all their rights. Ryan King had been in a guardianship for 15 years. Tanya had been in a guardianship for three years. Takora had been living in a car because her guardian was absent 
and she didn't have the legal right to sign a lease. And lastly, Marie, who we won our last trial over Zoom in California. There's Marie with her new supporter because her guardian was trying to force her to move away from her family and friends and her job, and she didn't want to. So we showed that Marie can use supported decision-making and now she gets to charge, be in charge of her life. So what we know is ever since Jenny, just since Jenny, in just eight years, 13 states in Washington, D.C. now have laws specifically recognizing supported decision-making. Your law encompasses it. 13 states now have laws that specifically say if a person can use supported decision-making, they shouldn't be in a guardianship. We have a national resource center. I'm the project director on supported decision-making. If you want more information, you can go to supporteddecisionmaking.org. And there are projects across the country. You're gonna hear from me in subsequent webinars about two supported decision-making projects that went amazingly just in Ohio, in Perry and Pickaway counties. But there are projects across the country. And I wanna leave you with this, is this is, like I said, a why presentation, why we should respect and honor everyone's right to make choices, why we should start with rights instead of starting with assuming guardianship is needed because there are opportunities all around us. I'm gonna show you in the next webinars that supported decision-making can make medical care better, can make special education better, can make vocational rehabilitation better, can make even end-of-life planning better. It can trace a straight line through a person's life, helping that person have the exact life that we want for them. Every teacher, every educational professional wants their students to have the best possible life. Every parent wants their children to have the best possible life. And the rest of these webinars, I'm going to show you how we can make that happen with supported decision making. In the meantime, that's my email address on the screen. I'm very happy to answer your questions, but if you have them, we can answer them today. If you have them later, please feel free to email me. I know that Steve has made this slide deck available. Please feel free to use it, to look at the resources, and to email me if you have any questions. And with that, I'm very happy to answer. Well, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, right. Lots to think about and uh, take in. Um, we uh, truly, like I said, we truly appreciate you being here and speaking on this. Um, it's definitely something that I think most of us in education have come across, but you know, really it isn't talked about. I actually received a comment during, the, during your presentation from somebody who's on the webinar saying that um, it's about time we started talking about this. So I think you definitely struck some chords there with uh, just getting people to think about it talk about it, bringing it to the forefront. So I, I do want to definitely uh, thank you for that. Um, if anybody has any questions at this time, please um, ask them. We have about uh, 18 more minutes left, 15, 18 more minutes left. Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, life happens and people have places to be and kids to get bathed and things like that. So um, I also appreciate Jonathan putting his email, direct email link in there. Um, there's some comments coming in. This was awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for the presentation from uh, the law perspective. This is great information. This has been great uh, and gave great perspectives to have real conversations with our families. Um, does anybody have any questions for Jonathan now? I think everybody's kind of just taken back and <laughs> trying to process it all. That's quite all right. I think, uh, <laughs> like I said, my hope is that in the, the next webinars, and remember what we're trying to do is, is do one specifically for parents and one specifically for teachers on things like education and vocational rehabilitation. By the way, if you can't make one, please go to the other. The information is the same. I'm just gonna be delivering it from slightly different perspectives so that we can learn how to put this into practice. The last thing I wanna do is tell you what you should be doing and not give you information on how you can make it work. Um, J Jonathan, this is Diane Boylan. Um, I've been working with parents in the courts. I'm a high school intervention specialist. And so I've been called in emergency sit situations where a child was hospitalized and the parent was not able to feed the child, not a child, he was 18 
uh, but in school and uh, not able to determine where the child was going to rehab. And so in that situation, is, is there a go-to for an emergency? Because that's where we can do the planning for post-graduation. But what I struggle with is that emergency um, where, you know, I had to get involved with the social workers at the hospitals and tell them the TV stations will be there if you release this adult on a highway with no aid um, the week of Christmas. You know, he was aggressive. He, you know, parents had no rights at age 18. Or that's what they were told. So my big thing here, and what you could help me figure out is teachers are usually the person that gets the call in the middle of the night saying so-and-so's in the hospital or blah, blah, blah. Okay, so first, um, I'm sorry. I know this is something that is not rare. And no, because it is not rare, it is a reason for doing exactly what you've talked about, coming up with a plan. Part of the work that I've done in Ohio that I'll, you know, spoiler alert, we're going to get into, is about creating linkages between schools and other organizations who they can go to in an emergency and who have good communication with each other. For example, if the person you're dealing with has a developmental disability or intellectual disability, every county in Ohio has a board working directly for people with developmental and intellectual disabilities. What we did there was create linkages between the board and the school to share information right. and resources back and forth. So in crises, there is someone to reach out to and hopefully already a familiarity with the situation in person. With that said, remember what I said that in an emergency, a true emergency, guardianship, especially temporary guardianship can be a very good thing. So it is not my place to say don't contact. And I know that there is a public guardian in Ohio. The name is, is escaping me. I've done presentations for them, but um, you know they are an option. In the worst case scenario, adult or child protective services are an option. Um, safety obviously comes first. My feeling is that what we need to do is get ahead of these problems, especially if there's, if there's a way to anticipate that they may happen to a particular person and start making contingencies as early as possible. That is a big part of what we call the coordinated support model that I'm gonna be telling you about uh, from Perry and Pickaway. I'm very happy to talk to you offline about that as well. Yeah, it thankfully it, it rectifies. There were so many things, like one was COVID, courts weren't seeing people in front of each other. So the whole process took forever. Then they moved him out of downstate. So the home visit couldn't, apparently take place to do a temporary guardianship. Mm -hmm. um, I told her, go to Office Max, get a medical power of attorney, get at least so that you can talk to the doc doctors who wouldn't talk to her. You know, it was just a crazy situation. It ended up working out because I didn't give up. It was Christmas Eve. They put him in an ambulance with no shoes. And I said, get him out of the ambulance. And I've, fortunately, they listened. Yep. And, and I've always um, believed there is and has to be a better way. And that's yes. why I talk about. And I love the power of attorney idea. I, I'm a huge fan of powers of attorney. One of the great advantages of a power of attorney is you can shape it. You can, you can say... As opposed to a guardianship where it's Diane Boylan has absolute control over my life, we can do a power of attorney that says, I want you to make medical decisions for me this way. Correct. Here are decisions you can't make. Here are things I want you to do. You'll talk to me first. 
Uh, again, sorry to keep spoiler alerting this, but I'll be giving you examples of language that you can use that sets <laughs> things like that up so that you can put that level of protection in while at the same time having maximum self-determination. Okay, so in the next three sessions, will you be sharing that language that we in the front line, the, the people working with the parents teach and the student to do self-determination activities to make them aware before graduation, you'll be giving us ways that, hey, you might wanna think about this and let's plan. Yes, my goal okay. is, for example, the next presentation is on special education and vocational rehabilitation. I'll be okay. discussing ways to write goals to maximize self-determination. I'll be discussing strategies. After that, we're gonna talk about medical care, what I call life planning. I will give you language you can adapt for powers of attorney and advanced directives. One no, no language is magic. That's why I say no one size fits all, but it helps to have a model and I always say, steal my stuff if it's going to help somebody. Okay, That's thank okay. you. Jonathan, I'd like to ask, um, you have such enthusiasm for this aspect of law. Um, how did, uh, is this the only type of litigation that you do or um, what brought you to this point to advocate for so many people? That's, that's very kind of you to say. Um, uh, so I don't have an origin story. Um, it's a little uncomfortable to talk about this, I apologize. But in, in, in the short version is family. Um, the story I was always told, and I only got the full story of really in the last 10 years. Um, I had an uncle who had cerebral palsy. And my uncle Bob was born in the late forties. And what my mom tells me is that the nurses at the NICU or whatever it served as that at the time, went to my grandfather and said, he's never gonna walk, he's never gonna talk. We can leave him by the window and nature takes its course. So grandpa gets a pediatrician. Pediatrician takes care of my uncle Bob who eventually comes to my grandfather and says, he's never gonna walk, he's never gonna talk. There are places for people like him. He'll be fed, he'll be taken care of, you never have to see him. Eventually nature will take its course. My grandfather puts an addition on his house in a ramp. No one had ever seen a ramp in the 50s. So I grew up in the 80s with a ramp and with an uncle at the dinner table. Um, it didn't matter that he couldn't talk because my grandfather fought for me in education. He could spell, he could tell jokes. He was just Uncle Bob, okay? Um, fast forward to, I'm in law school. It's the Americans Disabilities Act is still relatively new. And what I came to realize, pardon the cliche, is that people with disabilities still were not at the dinner table, literally or figuratively. Um, my grandfather was doing it in the 50s. And you know, walk down Main Street and tell me how many ramps you see going into businesses. So to be very honest, at the end of a long day, I can see this bluntly, it pissed me off. Um, I, I, I don't understand why we have left behind um, an entire, the largest minority, if you think about it, of, of people. So the only thing I've ever wanted to do as a lawyer is this, is not guardianship. Guardianship found me. I never thought about guardianship until Jenny. In fact, that's a great shame of mine. But um, working for people and with people with disabilities, yeah, uh, except for playing left field for the Yankees, which I could have done better than the Yankees yesterday, or playing rhythm guitar for the Rolling Stones is the only thing I ever want to do. So like I said, there's no aha. I just think it's, it's common sense. And every parent of a person with a disability and every teacher and every professional who works with people with disabilities, I think knows exactly what I'm talking about. So we all have the same motivation. So if I can, if my long-winded story in any way makes you nod your head and say, me too, then we can all move in the same direction, you know, to get us to where we should have been decades ago. Mm -hmm. So if you're a parent and we know that 
accessing someone with your qualifications um, can be tough um, and very difficult to navigate. I mean, what what questions should parents be asking in order to to find support like you? One, well, again, thank you for your kind words, but there is an excellent organization in Ohio called Disability Rights Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, every state has what is called a protection and advocacy organization or PNA is the short version. They're all federally funded with the job of protecting and advocating for the rights of people with disabilities. So the first place I always tell people to start is Disability Rights Ohio. Um, there are good PNAs, there are bad PNAs. DRO has always been known as a very good one. I never guarantee that anyone will take your case, but they are charged to at a minimum give information and referral sources or technical assistance. But they can provide assistance you know, if they can. So I always say start there and then work your way from any information that they give you. If you're a parent of someone with intellectual developmental disabilities, your local board for people with dis developmental disabilities is a great resource. Mm -hmm. Ohio, and I'm not just idly complimenting your state, is very cool because you have 88 counties and 88 boards of people with disabilities. Other states, Virginia, for example, has just one for the whole state. You have very local organizations that can respond, in my opinion, to local needs. So those are the two I would start with, DRO and your board of DD. Uh, hey, Jonathan, a couple more things came in the chat box. Uh, this is very, very informative. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you so much. You are awesome. I'm presuming she's talking about you, but maybe me. Um, <laughs> I work with my local county board of developmental disabilities with youth ages 14 to 22. One of the biggest reasons I have had many families approach me about pursuing guardianship is due to their doctor recommending it to having a diagnosis or a disability. What resources or suggestions do you have to help empower families to help educate medical medical care providers? Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Um, and I'm, give me a second, I'm gonna put something in the chat box um, and I'll explain it in a sec. Let me put this to everyone. But yes, resources and, and information and education are incredibly important. We find, I, I was part of a study that found that the three top referrals for guardianship are schools and education professionals actually at the top with doctors being number three, family tends to be number two, family and friends. Um, a big part of what we need is information. I think I always say that doctors and judges are susceptible to the cultural expectations that we've had for 1500 years as everyone else. So one thing I did and what I put in the chat box is a link to the website of the Missouri Developmental Disabilities Council. Remember, every state has a DD council. So the reason I put Missouri's in is I worked with them to create a series of informational guides. Go to the website, scroll all the way down to the bottom right. You'll find, I think, seven or eight guides that talk about these exact issues. The very first one is called, Do I Have to Get Guardianship? And these are all short, accessible, easy reads that you can start to educate yourself and that you can also use to educate others. There's one on supported decision-making in healthcare, another on education. So I wrote these to have no more than five pages of text, single spaced. It's laid out, there are pictures, there's big stuff. I think they're all 10 to 15 very easy read pages. I recommend starting there and educating yourself. The things we're gonna talk about in the future presentations are gonna take us to some more of that material but to have it on hand is, is particularly helpful. Um, I agree, doctors can be part of the problem. So can lawyers. I think all of us are susceptible to 15 years, 100 years of culture. I was before Jenny. So give a shot to that one and see. And like I said, ask a lot of questions. Get as much information as you can. One of the most important things we can do is talk to each other. Uh, a couple more. Um, thank you so much. Very in thought, uh, informative and thought provoking. This was fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then another question. 
Um, in future presentations, are you going to be bringing examples of when guardianship is actually needed? Your example of someone who supported, your example of someone who supported decision making work was great. Actually, I, I, I'm sorry that I didn't do a good enough job in giving examples of when guardianship is needed. I think there's absolutely times. For example, one of the reasons why I will never hear me say anything bad about guardianship in concept is because my sister is the god is the guardian of my godson. I mean, thank God she is the guardian of my godson because there, there are things that James can do and things that he can't. One of the things he can't do is wrap his head around money. And because Judy is his guardian, she can manage his money while empowering him to do so many other things on his own. It's something he doesn't have to worry about or struggle with. And they tried many other things and the other things didn't work. So guardianship was appropriate because of that. So I think that's an absolutely perfect example. I also gave examples of, you know, the extreme situation. If a person is truly unable to understand or take part, a person in a coma clearly needs a guardian. I always say that somewhere in between a person in a coma and you is a line. I do not know where that line is, but it's on us to explore to make sure that whenever possible, we're on the right side of the line and protecting rights and choices. But if a person truly needs it, guardianship can be very helpful. Uh, there, was a, there was a question um, about sharing um, the links. Uh, yes, they will be gathered and made available um, as well as the recordings when the series uh, is concluded. That puts us right at 7.30. Um, in the interest of time, I just you know want to be respectful of that. Thank you guys all for attending this evening. Like Jonathan said, if you are unable um, to make the um, each, either time slot going forward, um, you know, please log on to the other ones. We will also make the recordings available if you are registered uh, to be able to go back and reference them. Um, Jonathan, thank you for, you know, an amazing kickoff to the series. Like I said, we're, um, you know, really excited to have you in, in our region, but also, um, you know, there's statewide, there's people on here, it looked like from Toledo, Cleveland, um, Southeast Ohio. Um, so to, to have statewide impact and have that conversation um, with everyone here is awesome to us at uh, State Support Team 11. So um, thank you for your time this evening. And we will see everybody um, the next uh, session two is October 27th. Um, again, two to 3.30 for educators and related pr practitioners, and then six to 7.30 for parents, families, and guardians. Session three will be November 10th. And then the concluding session um, culminating where everyone's together in the same evening session um, will be December 1st. If you have any questions, please email me at the state support team or reach out to us and we will do our best to answer them. And we hope you have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone.